Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Coming up, we're going to talk about how Pakistan's Indus River is starting to dry up and why that could catapult the region into war. Mm. But first, in pregnancy, the placenta, as you know, is a very critical organ. It allows the fetus to obtain nutrition and oxygen and in the process filters harmful substances from the mother's body. But our understanding of how protective that placenta is has been changing. Some ingested substances are known to cross the boundary and cause harm, but how about alcohol or phthalates? And in the case of air pollution, a mother's exposure is increasingly correlated with health problems in the infant, from cardiovascular to neurodevelopment. But how do inhaled particles lead to these problems? New research in the Journal of the American Medical Association Network opened this month is pointing to one potential mechanism, changes in the thyroid. What's going on and what can be done to protect the most vulnerable from potentially lifelong health effects? My next guest is an author on the research. Dr. Carrie Breton, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the USC in Los Angeles. Welcome, Dr. Breton. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. What got you looking at air pollution and the thyroid? Well, um, believe it or not, I grew up in Southern California in the 80s, and I was... I grew up living through smoggy alert days and swimming in the summer and feeling that really icky feeling in your lungs after a bad air day. And so I've been thinking about air pollution for many years now and really want to understand how early in life does air pollution affect us. And so we wanted to look in the womb Mm -hmm. and ask the question at the earliest stage of life, can air pollution affect uh, our health? And we started with looking at the thyroid because the thyroid is very important in metabolism and fetal brain development. Yeah, and you saw elevated levels of this hormone thyroxine in infants whose mothers were exposed to more air pollution. How could that affect the child's health later in life? Well, we know that thyroid hormones are really important, um, as I said, in metabolism and in brain growth. And we already know that having either too little hormone or too much hormone can have bad effects. That's, in fact, why uh, the state of California and other states have a newborn screening program that tests newborns for thyroid hormone because if the baby has too little hormone, they can intervene, they can give medications, and they can prevent cognitive deficits from happening. So there's a lot that's already known about thyroid hormone levels and how they affect health. And so if the environment now is affecting those levels, it may be skewing our systems, making us more vulnerable for these health effects. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to, uh, to be clear, you saw hormonal changes, but this isn't proof of direct harm yet. Right. Even though we know from other work that there are harms, right? Tell us why. Well, in this study, all we measured was the thyroid hormone T4 directly, and we measured it in the newborn. Um, So what we showed was that higher particulate matter is associated with higher thyroid hormone levels. But we did not, in this study, relate that change in thyroid hormone levels to any child health outcome later in life. Mm -hmm. That's actually something we would like to do as a next step. Mm-hmm. Does it seem to matter what kind of air pollution we're talking about, like particulates or chemicals or small particles, soot, whatever? Yes, it does matter. We looked at both particulate matter as well as ozone and nitrogen, di- nitrogen dioxide, so several different ambient pollutants that are very typically regulated and monitored across the nation and in Los Angeles, and we saw these effects with particulate pollution, not with ozone or not nitrogen dioxide. Mm-hmm. Do we have any clues yet of the mechanism? You know, there are a lot of theories and there are a lot of investigations into this. One of those is uh, that air pollution in general may be increasing inflammation throughout the body, and that that may have its own set of cascading effects as the baby is developing. Does it it concern you any that you're seeing more and more wildfires now that might be not a factor in years past? Yes. um, Wildfires emit a lot of particulate matter. Uh, it, it may be different sizes of particulate matter and different composition than vehicle exhaust and diesel exhaust, but it's still 
fundamentally particulates come from incomplete combustion and things that burn. And wildfires burn a lot of stuff, and they we ha- emit tons of particles into the air. Is our understanding of air pollution and health changing from what it used to be? Well, I think what I can safely say is that we know air pollution is bad for us, and we're finding you know, that even at the earliest moments in life, it may be bad for us. Uh, what I can tell you is that in Southern California, we've been trying to reduce air pollution for you know decades now, and we've do- we've been successful in doing that. The levels have come down in the last de- decade, in part because we've regulated emissions. And you know the nice thing about this is that we've also seen the corresponding increases in kids' health when air pollution levels come down. So we know it works, and we know we can do something about it. That's interesting. You really have enough data now to know that, and, and enough years to know that it does it does matter. Yes, yes. Uh, we have um, just in our own work, we've followed a cohort of children called the Children's Health Study for more than twenty years, and the whole purpose of that uh, study was to look at air pollution's effects on kids' health. Mm-hmm. Do we know if particles are actually crossing the placenta, or is there some intervening mechanism? We don't know that with any certainty. Um, And I think it's going to be very dependent on what size particle we're talking about um, and and whether the placenta can filter that out and be that barrier, or also whether in the mom the particles cause an indirect effect and then all those cascading chemicals and molecules that change in the mom can pass the placenta Mm -hmm. even if the particle itself doesn't. You know, I don't have to tell you, you've already told me that you've grown up in Southern California where it's smoggy and polluted, and it's polluted in a lot of places now. Um, and in those days, we always have an ozone alert, right? For, yes. And we tell, we tell the elderly not to go out or to breathe the air or to stay indoors. Should we be saying that to pregnant mothers now? Be careful. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it's, I would say it couldn't hurt. And if you're concerned and you're a pregnant mom and you check, you can check daily the air quality index. And, you, and if you see that it's a really bad air day, you might want to change your behavior. You might want to not go out and exercise really heavily. You might want to walk your dog on uh, a quieter street away from heavy traffic. Uh, so there are little things that yeah. that you could do. No, I'm saying you know as part of the what you see on the weather forecast at night. You know they, there are these there are these warnings. Why not include in these you know these warnings to pregnant people? Well, they they do say for sensitive subpopulations. So if you want to consider pregnancy sensitive <laughs> population, you know then. Then yes, you you know I mean you might want to consider it. I think it's a sort of an individual level decision. How how is there any obstacle for you to doing more studies on this? You know I'm going to give you the the sixty four dollar question I give to a lot of my researchers. If you had an unlimited blank check and I have one right here in my pocket for you, uh, what would what would you like to study? What would you need to know? How would you do that? Uh, well, I would continue to address the the broader question of can the environment what and how can the environment affect fetal development and and what is that tied to 10 years 20 years down the line as we become adults are we now going to be at increased risk and more susceptible for all of Mm. these things that we're dealing with and i would we could start with the thyroid and there's a lot more we could do with understanding the thyroid itself looking at it more holistically looking at the difference between how it affects mom's thyroid and baby's thyroid together and disentangling that um, but there are also other pollutants one could ask the same questions about. Possibly, you know, uh, outgassing of rugs or things like that or, or plastics in the home? or. Absolutely. Uh, I really addressed outdoor air pollution in, in this particular publication. Indoor air pollutants and the sources of those is a whole other ballgame. Yeah, something we should be thinking about, though, as for pregnant Definitely. people. Yeah. Um, is there any phase of pregnancy, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that the earlier in pregnancy, pregnancy, the first trimester is more important than others, or am I being wrong about that? 
Well, actually, when we, we actually tried to address that question yeah. specifically in this publication, and we looked at month-by-month month exposures in pregnancy to see if we could find that one, one month mattered the most in terms of being exposed. And what we really found was that actually most of pregnancy mattered, it, that exposure anywhere from mid to late pregnancy, not quite as much in the early um, very early pregnancy, and that might have something to do with the fact that the thyroid, the fetal thyroid, does, doesn't actually develop and start kicking in and producing its own thyroid until the second trimester. Huh. Is, is there thoughts that you that you might give uh, pregnant moms thyroid, you know, pills or injections or anything like that to in, you know to to measure the level in the fetus and say, well, we need to have some more or less. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of monitoring of that already. Mm-hmm. And so if a, if a pregnant woman's thyroid levels fall within what are clinically normal ranges, you wouldn't need to do anything anyway. But that's an interesting thought. I mean, some, some women who have a thyroid disease going into pregnancy, yeah. they are already monitored for that. And, yes, right. they, could, they will be monitored, in it, and they try to adjust those levels. Have you noticed that air pollution is getting any better? I mean, better meaning less of it. In right. Well, in that depends California. on where you. Yeah, that yeah. depends on where you are, right? So, in Southern California, yes, we've had reductions in our air pollution levels, but in many other places around the world, the air pollution's um, mm-hmm. going up. Uh, are, are pregnant moms taught about this? Do their doctors know about air pollution as a potential hazard? I don't think, generally speaking, that there's. a a great level of of discussion about environmental harms such as air pollution Mm. when you're in the doctor's office. All right. Well, well, maybe we started one now today, Dr. Breton. Yes, maybe. That would be great. Dr. Carrie Breton, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the USC in Los Angeles. Good luck to you. Thank you for, for being so informative with us today. Thank you very much. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, water, Uh, how the wars of the future uh, maybe fought uh, over water, and it's uh, it's going to be a really big issue. Water rights. Uh, Jeff Nesbitt is author of a new book. This is the way the world ends: how droughts and die-offs, heat waves and hurricanes are converging on America. He's going to be here with us. Our number eight four four seven two four eight two five five. You can also tweet us at Cy Fry. We'll be right back after this break. Stay with us. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. Four years ago, Saudi Arabia's biggest dairy company called Al Mare started buying up land in the Arizona desert. Why would they do that? Saudi Arabia was running out of water, and the company needed alfalfa, a highly water-intensive crop, to feed their cows. And the area where they farm has less restricted access to the Colorado River and the state's water less restricted than places like Phoenix or Tucson, meaning it's a great place to make hay and then ship it overseas back to Saudi Arabia. Is this just a little foreshadowing about the future of water and about how big a commodity H2O will become in a hotter, drier world? And some places already looking at solutions like turning wastewater into drinking water. And here's our question for our listeners. Does your city already recycle wastewater and put it back in your tap? How does it taste? Was there an ick factor? And was it a political fight to get it done? Our number, 844-724-8255, 844-SITE-TALK. You can also tweet us at SciFry. And the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because my next guest writes about the future of water, of water and other climate-related conflicts in his new book, This is the Way the World Ends, How Droughts and Die-Offs, Heat Waves and Hurricanes Are Converging on America. Jeff Nesbitt is the author, Executive Director of Climate Nexus, a nonprofit that focuses on climate change communications. He's the former Director of Public Relations at the National Science Foundation, where I knew him back Way back in the day. Yes. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Uh, let's talk about uh, first about other countries coming here to use U.S. water resources. Is that right about Saudi Arabia? It is absolutely right, and, the, and some of the folks in, in Arizona didn't take so kindly to it. There was a very contentious uh, local town hall not too long ago where they had four sheriff's deputies planted outside the, the hall as they were trying to explain. But the story in Saudi Arabia goes ex, ex, back even further. Saudi Arabia made a, a 
pretty colossally bad bet where they began to drain the water aquifer to try to grow wheat. They paid folks to they paid farmers to grow wheat, and they essentially drained the the water aquifer that has some of their fresh water that had been in place for thousands of years. So um, then you combine that with climate change sitting on top like the 800 pound gorilla. Um, they they've essentially run out of water, so they've had to go elsewhere to get. Um, crops that are water intensive so they can feed their people. And that's, so they came to Arizona. So we're basically shipping our water as we grow it Correct. overseas. And they call it a virtual water network. The Saudis in, 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 in cables that WikiLeaks has released. China's doing the same thing. They bought a, the, you know America's largest um, pork producer um, in, in order to do the same thing. So both Saudi Arabia and China are going around the world to, to try to solve their natural resource problems. And we're going to see more and more of this as water becomes more scarce everywhere. A- absolutely. And that's the, actually the point of this book is that water is more scarce in lots Lots of places on Earth. We're lucky in the United States. We live in a temperate zone. Um, we're lucky that some of the worst impacts of climate change aren't here yet. They're definitely here in other parts of the world. Sub-Saharan Africa, some countries simply don't have any food at all. And Northern Africa is, is suffering in the Sahel region. And in your book, you say, you say, quote, Yemen is the first casualty of what will almost certainly be the water wars of the future. Yemen is a fascinating story. People have already written about what happened in Syria when the farmers moved out of their off their farms to the cities and it triggered the civil unrest. They've looked at Egypt where the food riots led to the Arab Spring. Yemen is a is a more stark example. Um, diplomats knew the country was running, running out of water. They rent, 14 of the 16 aquifers were drained, no water. And they were predicting to the water minister and others, you're going to have riots in the streets. Mm-hmm. You need to, to deal with this. They didn't. And that's exactly what, two years later, civil unrest and then the collapse of the government. So okay. that's what a water war looks like. And you say the future is here now, meaning disruption. It is absolutely. And this is, I'll tell you, this is one of the reasons why national security analysts have looked at climate change as a an imminent national security threat because when you have wars over water, you have wars over food insecurity. And I'll tell you, half the people in the world right now are, are, are eating food that's imported into their country because there isn't enough land, arable land or others, to grow it right now. So it, it's here now in other parts of the world. And that's what I hear you saying. Uh, and, and, and the title of your book, This is the Way the World Ends, that comes from not with a bang but with well, a whimper. Correct. So it's a little drip, 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 drip under drip, drip. the radar. Yes, Plum. until until it's until it's no longer, until it's, you know, and then people fight. I mean, a good example that I, it sort of went unnoticed is India and Pakistan almost went to war over water um, less than a year ago in Kashmir when India threatened to shut off access to the Indus River um, and threatened to start a war over that. If India should make that decision, um, Pakistan would suffer downstream. If China then Mm. would make a similar decision, it would harm both India and Pakistan. So these drip, drip, drips of water as they run out of water can, can lead it to catastrophes, essentially. Are we going to be talking about the future, water futures, like we talk about oil futures or commodity futures? Uh, not only are we, we are, I can we tell are. you with certainty, I just met with, a, I mean, I've, I've met with a billionaire who is already planning to treat water as a commodity, where he, they will sell water to places like northern China and Saudi Arabia and others. It is, at, we're absolutely there already in some parts of the world. So you mean somebody's hoarding the water? Uh, they're not hoarding. Like a but, cartel of water. <laughs> I don't know if there could be a cartel. We have a cartel. Cartel of maple syrup. Why not have a why cartel? Not a, exactly. Uh, I don't know how. You know. Yeah. I don't know that we'll be talking about barrels of water just yet. But clearly, people are looking at this as a business. Talking with Jeff uh, Jeff Nesbitt, author of "This Is the Way the World Ends: uh, How Droughts and Die-offs, Heat Waves, and Hurricanes Are Converging on America." Let's see if we can get a phone call or two in. Let's go to uh, Ken in Tucson. Hi, Ken. Hi. How are you? Hi. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I was just going to say, we, we've tried, even though we're in the, the, a desert here, we have not had politically had the luck getting um, either recycled water or even the Colorado River water into our water system. We still use the aquifer. Hmm. They tried it back in the 90s, and it destroyed the water system. And the recycled water, is it is used for golf courses, but it's not used for anything else. Oh, wow. Oh, thanks for the call. So I would encourage, that's very interesting to hear. Um, 
uh, they, they, Tucson and others might want to go talk to Mayor Garcetti in Los Angeles because they actually are. They have figured this out, how to reclaim water. A significant portion of Los Angeles's water is starting to come from reclaimed water. They have a plan. Mm-hmm. They have a, it's a pretty extensive plan for doing that. Um, I think, and honestly, other cities uh, need to yeah. start figuring this out. I went, I was at the American Water Works Association uh, speaking there a while back, and I went to the exhibit area, and there are people there who collared me and said, you know, we are recycling water. We are, we, we now can, you know, s- supply cities on larger and larger scales. We're experimenting with it. And I said to, to him, can the people tell the difference? Mm. He said they certainly can. When they drink our recycled water, they notice it's much tastier than their, <laughs> than their old water. So, uh, I mean, there's good news about it. There is. Uh, you know, interesting. I think Los Angeles' plans are the next day. De- I mean, I, I've also talked to their water uh, d- district uh, leadership, they think about climate change every single day in Los Angeles right now. They're planning for that right now. And they have plans, I think, a third. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but a very significant portion of their water is going to come from reclaimed water. You tell a really interesting story. And I, uh, uh, let me just lead into this by saying, you know, don't people listen to scientists anymore? <laughs> or they ever be, listen to this about what the, the, the strip, drip, drip is? But you really uncovered a great mythology about Albert Einstein mm. and FDR. Tell us that story you tell in the book. So it's actually the way I open the book. The, uh, there's this myth, and um, you probably know the truth, I'm sure, but there, there's this myth that Albert Einstein writes a letter, the famous Albert Einstein writes a letter to FDR, warns that the Nazis are about to, you know, that scientists are about to unlock the atom and develop an, a nuclear bomb. Um, and that that triggered the process. Bingo. It, bingo. It's, Great it's fear. simply not true. Not true. He had to write a second letter and then a third letter and then a fourth letter. And after the third letter, after the second letter, I think, first or second letter, they fobbed him off on, on, a, on a lieutenant and a, and a little commission and threw $60,000 at Enrico Fermi to build, you know, which to, to, to try to test the theory. Because basically FDR had a war to prosecute. He didn't want to listen to Albert Einstein or the scientists at all. And it was only a couple, when Britain and got serious um, at looking at it that FDR finally said, oh, maybe we better pay attention to this. But so... Then the Manhattan Project. And then the Manhattan Project was born. So, you know... so I didn't know yeah. that story. Yeah. I was just with you thinking, <laughs> you know, that was that one letter that did, did but it. But you're saying that's the parallel we have it today. Is. It is. Science, there are thousands of, of Albert Einstein climate scientists yelling as loudly as they possibly can, please pay attention. The wolf is at the door right now. We can't wait for 30, 40, 50 years to see how this all plays out. Mm-hmm. 844-724-8255 is our number. Um, you also point out in your book that the large international companies like Nestle and Coca-Cola and Pepsi are understanding this problem. Correct. The Nestle chapter in this book is fascinating. People are... They, they, Nestle has analyzed the water scarcity issues in every single country. They're the country. biggest food company in the world. Biggest food company in the world rely seriously on water for uh, you know th- for food that they make. They've analyzed water scarcity problems in every country on earth, and they've told diplomats um, quietly um, that it, this may be the biggest gr- imminent crisis in the world is water scarcity issues mm-hmm. in lots and lots of countries. All right, let's see. A lot of, lot of folks from Arizona and <laughs> the places where they need all this water uh, calling. Let me see if I can uh, get a phone call in from uh, uh, Brandon. And uh, Let's go to Georgia. Augusta, Georgia. Hi, Brandon. Hello. Hi there. Sarah. Go ahead. My comment is, I think you asked how water recycling would mm-hmm. save. And the fact is that the majority of Americans are already drinking recycled water. <laughs> the fact that they're drawing their waters from rivers. They're just downstream down mm-hmm. from other cities. Yeah, that's a good point. It is a good point, and he's right, actually. I mean, we sort of, t- like, I'm drinking a cup of water here. I take for granted that it's clean. Uh, and New York it, City water. Yeah, it's, it's New York like City it, water. Yeah. So. Um, but he is right. Uh, but in, in other parts of the world, and I'll pick on China again, they have a severe pollution problem in the rivers. It's, it's potentially, in some places, too polluted, too costly to clean up the pollution. But here in the United States, your caller is exactly right. You know, much of our clean water comes from rivers where they have to clean, you know, they have to clean the chemicals and make sure that it, it mm-hmm. comes to us clean. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, there's a difference between that sort of normal process and actually reclaiming water as it runs off. 
Mm. Um, well, here's a, here's a tweet came in from Ben who says, we wouldn't have to recycle so much water if we stopped raising animals for food. Animal agriculture is the problem. We need to stop encouraging it. So there's absolutely some scientific and, and, and well, I'll just say, fly. yes, there is some truth there. Um, the, the, the using, using land for, for, you know, to, to basically produce meat, meat mm-hmm. as a diet takes up a lot of land and we could, we, we could make some progress with natural solutions in the land, like growing more trees, growing more plants um, in some of those places. Um, it would make it. It would make an impact. It's about that, that's about fifteen percent of the climate problem. Yeah. On it's a very complicated question, but he but there's there's he's correct about that. Let's talk about uh, the climate climate change. Um, the shipping giant Maersk just sent a big container ship through the Arctic for the first time. And aside from oil exploration that's been going on there, the Arctic is the world's next big. Economic zone, right? It abs- it's free of ice in the summer. It is, and I tell you, it's. Uh, this, we, I talk about this in the book as well. Russia is clearly paying attention to this. They have six, seven, eight ice cutters. They're preparing uh, to deal with a, you know, an Arctic region where you can ship through the Arctic. It's, it's, it's like nature is building the equivalent of the Panama Canal through the Arctic right now, as we're seeing it. And nobody expected that for 40, 50 years. It is happening right now. And some countries are paying attention, like Russia. Others, like the United States, simply aren't. We, we still don't have, you know, a modern ice cutter to, to even one up there. We haven't run it through the Pentagon. That's why. Oh. <laughs> we need a DARPA project or something like that. We do. That will, it, get, that yeah, will get the attention, it, you know, the budget. Would, it would, actually. The one ice cutter was a Coast Guard um, ice cutter. I spent years of my life at the National Science Foundation trying to convince Congress to, to, to do that. So. I rest my case. Yeah. Uh, this is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. And, and you know, and, and the Russians actually planted a flag on the, <laughs> didn't they put a little flag on the Arctic seabed about 10 years ago? They did. And, they, they, and, and, and the Scandinavian countries know this? They do. They all know that. They all know this yeah. is the next big area? They all. And, if, and one of the, another one, of the, and there's, then the scientists know it as well. The scientists have documented what are called regime shifts in the Arctic and what that means, and it's happening right now, is one sort of like grasslands become another entire ecosystem. It's all happening right before our eyes. I was, was a story I read today, I think it was, Washington Post, I'm not quite sure where. The, the Trump administration came out with a report last month that predicts the planet's going to warm under the 7 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century, and much worse than we thought. But they're using the report to justify freezing auto efficiency, fuel efficiency standards by basically saying, hey, you know, it's going to happen. It is that yeah, you yeah. know that's well, actually a shot. It's shocking that 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 was in that report, and that's the justification. What they're doing is they're basically saying it's a fatalistic approach, and two, they're simply saying, well, the United States can't make a dent in this problem, and uh, that they're now you know acknowledging, even as they're trying to freeze these you know and and and, and freeze the clean car standards. What is uh, well, I'll just say it bluntly. What's wrong about that? What's wrong-headed about that is that America has to be a leader on this fight, and and when America leads, everybody else follows on this particular issue. So get, just throwing up your hands and saying we can't, you know, make mm-hmm. a dent, and it doesn't make any sense. But more importantly, I think what they've acknowledged in the when this gets to court, and it will get to court, this probably is is the linchpin for why they'll lose. You think so? Or one of the linchpins for why they'll lose. That combined with the fact that n- nobody wants cities in America to to Get dirtier again, or to be underwater. Or to be Florida underwater. would be underwater. Uh, yes, if you raise seven degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there are lots of places that would be underwater. That yes. What's the What's the one message you want people to take away from this book? That climate change uh, impacts are here right now. That it, it's not a it's not a distant threat in space and time. It is here right now, including even in America. We need to recognize that, and that there are things that we collectively can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and can individuals really? Absolutely. Take, Absolutely. Do something. I'll just give you one. Give me, ex- give me yes, an example. I'll give you an example. Even a simple thing like uh, science is now emerging that says if everybody starts to build green backyards and green their local part of the world, collectively that are, adds up to a large carbon sink. So and that's just one example. It's the kind of thing that's in in, in the book, you know, uh, Project Drawdown. Right. But there are things like that that individuals can do um, that will have a meaningful 
will imp impact collectively. They can also vote, and what I'm and there are two ways to vote. You can vote for uh, governments that act or don't act, but you can also vote as a consumer. So if if it, c there are big companies that are looking at um, meaningful sustainability practices, find out who they are and and vote for them as a as a consumer. So vote with your your political vote and vote with your pocketbook. All right, the, the, we're going to have you stay through the break. Just hang around a little bit longer. With Jeff uh, Nesbitt is author of This Is the Way the World Ends, How Droughts and Die-Offs, Heat Waves and Hurricanes Are Converging on America. And I tell you, that when I read the first half of the book, I was ready to give up. <laughs> you know? Don't give up. Yeah, Don't well, give up. You, you go ahead. The second half of the book, you're a little more optimistic, uh, but you go through all these things. It's like a physician. You, you present the problem, and then you give the treatment plan. And you, But you remain optimistic. I do. You remain optimistic that if we... If we we have enough time to right the ship? I do. We, not a whole lot of time, but yes, and we are going to right this ship. There you have it. We'll stay with us. We're going to have Jeff Nesbitt stay with us uh, through the break. Our number, 844-724-8255. You can also tweet us uh, at SciFry, 844-SciTalk, uh, if you prefer, on the t telephone. We'll be right back after this break. Stay with us. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. We're talking about climate change and conflict and water shortages as the new national, international problem with uh, Jess, Jeff Nesbitt is author of This is the Way the World Ends. And uh, our number, 844-724-8255. I said we'd take some phone calls. We have a lot of interesting ones. Let's go to South Bend, Indiana. Gabrielle, hi. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I love your show. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I um, live in a city that um, used to have a um, municipal energy office, and the director of that office not only was recommending a waste to energy um, mm. uh, project, but a water recycling project. And um, it wasn't the community that was pushing back. It was actually the response from the um, administration a couple of years ago was to eliminate the, um, the energy office. So um, it's not from the community that the pushback is coming from, at least in our case. It was um, there was some sort of um, pushback. And um, so the office was eliminated. And those two ideas just died on the vine when that office was let go. Mm. Jeff, you talked about the ballot box being... Yeah, about. that's and honestly, that's really unfortunate. Um, my organization is uh, partially responsible for a new movement called the We Are Still In Movement that includes hundreds of mayors, and I think there are lots of mayors who are figuring this out. But what's unfortunate about what your college just talked about is that there's lots of money to be made in both energy efficiency and water reclam reclamation. Um, they, sh you know, th if mayors are smart, uh, they can figure out. There's just as companies are, there's money to to be made in sustainability. Um, I also want to uh, shout out to a fellow Hoosier because I grew up right down the road in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So. <laughs> Let's shout out to uh, Denver. Let's go to Keith in Denver, Colorado. Hi, D. Hi, Keith. Welcome. Hey. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Yeah, I, I'm going to play with them. Oh, did we drop you? A re I'm sorry. Say again, because your your phone is coming in and out. Start over. Okay. Uh, I'm an employee for Denver Water, hmm. and we have our own uh, reuse plant where we recycle water coming off the water treatment plant. And so that that uh, gets goes out to areas for irrigation, uh, the city golf courses, uh, city parks, et cetera. Whereas be prior to that occurring, that was uh, treated water that was going out there for irrigation. So th there's cost saving measures there where we're not wasting treat treated water, uh, potable water to put on uh, you know courses and and recreation areas. A um, couple other different things they're doing now is even mm -hmm. uh, inline turbines mm -hmm. on some of our high flow conduits to uh, produce electricity outside of our hydroelectric plants that, that are have been in place for years. Interesting. So it, he's he's ex it, and I applaud what Denver Water and others are doing. There's a, there's a compact of all the states in, uh, all the way down through Mexico that are all talking to each other about the Colorado River Basin. They're getting very smart about it. They're looking at you know appropriate uses, and they've all agreed effectively if if the water tables get too low in the Colorado River that those upstream won't drain the water and everybody will conserve along the way. It's it's really heartening, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so optimistic. It's heartening to see that people 
people are getting this now. They're looking at potential water scarcity issues right now. Colorado, the Colorado River Basin states and compacts um, are leading the way in that regard. Um, I will say others are as well. One, you know, Israel, for instance, is starting to export its um, water desalinization technology even to Arab countries. Mm -hmm. So Saudi Arabia may be getting its fresh water from technology that um, Israel company, Israeli is, companies have developed. Is desalinization at, at the point where it can be done efficiently and in large scale? It can be done. It can be done. Let's put it that way. Efficiently, large scale, I think that's still an open question. It's still awfully expensive. Um, but for countries like Saudi Arabia, they may not have a choice in terms of drinking water. They're, they're, they're going to have to do this. Saudi Arabia can afford it because they, they transfer their oil wealth, oil wealth. But countries like Yemen, no, they can't. They're out of luck. Mm -hmm. But you still remain optimistic. I, I do. And here's ha, ha, yeah, go ahead. Yes. And here's why I'm optimistic. Yeah. Um, uh, look, the National Science Foundation, where I used to work, um, the, Google was born um, the, you know, within 10 years. I mean, big. the tech industry was born within 10 to 15 years, upended other big industries and, and companies, upended the media industry in a very short period of time. We're seeing two trends right now. We're seeing potentially the end of the internal combustion engine, and we're seeing the, the, the rise of s distributed solar power everywhere. Mm -hmm. Both of those things, in my opinion, will accelerate very, very quickly in the next 10 years. We need them to accelerate that quickly. And if they do, and if there's money in the system that changes um, the energy system, we can we can get this done. And then you combine that with my faith in scientists to learn, look at carbon capture and even carbon drawdown out of the air. Over time, I believe we can solve this problem. It's a very wicked dilemma, but I have faith in uh, scientists' ability to study this and 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 come up with answers and, the, and people's ability to make money from, uh, you know, new energy systems and new transportation systems. You can read uh, more about this in Jeff Nesbitt's uh, new book. This is the way the world ends and uh, how droughts and die-offs, heat waves and hurricanes are converging on America. We only got to half of those topics, but there's a lot in this book. It's a great book, Jeff. Well, thank you. Uh, and you're also executive director of Climate Nexus, a nonprofit that focuses on climate change communications. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks, for thanks for having me. You've probably played the game where you try to spot different shapes or animals in the clouds. Clouds are good for that because they come in all kinds of, sh you know, different shapes and textures from puffy cumulus to wispy cirrus clouds. And just last week, I saw my first flying saucer cloud, the lenticular cloud. But scientists look to clouds for a different reason. They can tell us about the dynamics of the atmosphere, the physics of water droplets on a tiny scale. NASA sent up a balloon to capture images of one of the rarest clouds, something called electric blue or polar mesospheric clouds. They form way up in the sky, 50 miles up, and start around, well, specks of meteor dust for nuclei. My next guests are here to tell us about these elusive electric blue polar mesospheric clouds. Let me introduce them. David Fritz is the pr principal investigator of NASA's PMC Turbo Mission and founder and manager of Global Atmospheric Technologies and Sciences, Inc., which is headquartered in Newport News, Virginia. Gary Thomas is co-investigator at NASA's Aeronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere and Professor Emeritus of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Welcome, both of you, to Science Friday. Thank you, Ira. It's good to be with you. Nice to have you. Uh, Gary, there, there are many names for these clouds. Electric blue, polar mesospheric, not a Lucient. I get that right? What do they look like? No. <laughs> no? No to Lucient? No. Knock to Lucent. Oh, knock to Lucient. <laughs> Join the crowd of words that I have uh, mawed. Uh, what do they look like? Can we see them here in New York? What, 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 how do you find them? No, I think you have to go up uh, past the Canadian border, uh, uh, roughly 50 degrees latitude. Also, you need to go up in summertime and stay around until dusk or get up very early in, in the morning to see them because they're um, very thin and so you can only see them when the sky background is dark. Oh, that's interesting. And they are really electric blue? Well, yes, but uh, <clears throat> they just, uh, really, it's just scattered sunlight, ah. but they appear that way because the black background, they just appear almost luminous. Hmm. Uh, they look like almost like they're emitting light themselves, but they're not. They're just scattered sunlight. I gotcha. And in the past, there's been some debate about how these clouds form, maybe from meteorite dust. Is that right? 
Uh, yes, I think maybe Dave Fritz could talk a little bit more about that. Dave? Well, the meteors come in, uh, they ablate at high altitudes. Uh, they lead to many, many very tiny particles. And because their sedimentation is so small, uh, it takes a very long time for them to settle out of the atmosphere. And um, so nucleation sites are preferred locations for the creation of uh, water droplets and, and ice particles. And so when the temperature is sufficiently cold, uh, that happens readily. Now, what's really unique about this portion of the atmosphere is that even though it is continuously illuminated by the sun during the summer at high latitudes, it's by far the coldest place on the planet. Yeah, it's it's, it's hard to think of clouds that develop 50 miles up. Isn't that like at the edge of space? Uh, some people consider that to be the case, yes, uh, but they're very, very tiny particles, and so they um, are buoyed up. They maintain their altitude to some degree by the larger scale atmospheric dynamics that cause uh, upwelling of the atmosphere. So there's a sort of a five centimeter per second uh, general upward flow, and so that helps preserve the particles at those altitudes. Now, I want to ask you, David, you, you came up with this idea sort of serendipitously, uh, you know, because you noticed there was gun on a camera. <laughs> well, is that, is that's that a scientific so, term, right? Yeah. yeah, that's very scientific. So, um, we have a, Gary and I have a colleague who is now deceased, but he did the really pioneering studies of noctilucent clouds uh, really 60 years ago. He actually did stereo viewing from the ground, but his cameras were, uh, of course, not what we have available to us now. Uh, and he remarkably identified the key dynamics and the altitude and other things that uh, have, were proven later on. Um, but what is really exciting about this particular cloud layer is that um, it is very thin in many cases, and so it acts as a really spectacular tracer for really small scale motions in the atmosphere um, that would seem insignificant but are really uh, globally very important. So, are these clouds above the jet stream? Can you follow? Oh, the they're way, way, way above, above the jet stream. The, I'm trying to get an idea for our listeners exactly how high this is. These are very right, so high. Your jet, the jet stream is sort of at aircraft altitudes. Right. Uh, so, commercial aircraft fly at around 11 kilometers. Our uh, balloon mission flew on a high altitude balloon at 38 kilometers, so three times higher. Uh, and it had to look up another 50 kilometers to see the PMCs above it. So why, why are you so interested? And these, these clouds, cloud layer. Well, my I'm a physicist. My passion is um, small scale waves and instabilities that transition to turbulence. And what is really remarkable about the PMC layer at very high altitudes is that um, I would argue that although it is very remote, it is almost certainly the very best place to study those processes on the planet. Uh, Gary, you interested for the same reason? Uh, well, sure. The physics certainly uh, excites me, too. I'm a physicist, but I'm also interested in the uh, aspect of climate uh, climate change because there is, I think, we're, there's pretty strong evidence now that these things have, have not been around for a long time. In fact, in 1885, they were first reported in the uh, in the literature and we've looked at a lot of reports going back into the 19th century and no reports whatsoever of anything resembling this kind of phenomenon so our idea is that these uh, clouds are actually produced by methane or at least indirectly caused by methane increases which have more than doubled over the past uh, century century and a half and methane is uh, is composed of carbon and four hydrogen atoms and this decomposes in the upper atmosphere to form water vapor, which in turn uh, collects on the uh, meteor dust particles. Interesting. So um, that's if the, if methane doubled, that means that the noctilucent clouds also must have doubled. And so another uh, aspect is that is that the uh, in 1885 uh, there were a fantastic uh, uh, red uh, sunsets. Uh, during that time because of the Krakatoa eruption that occurred two years before that. So our, we proposed that it was uh, it was the Krakatoa eruption that caused these things to be discovered, discovered in quotes for the first time. Interesting. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Uh, talking with uh, Gary Thomas and David Fritz. So, so, Gary, do you think these clouds can be used as a measure of climate change? 
Absolutely. The, uh, the formation of ice is, is exquisitely sensitive to temperature changes and also, uh, to a lesser extent, water vapor. So both of those uh, quantities, temperature and water vapor, uh, are changing in the upper atmosphere and uh, as a result of climate change. Hmm. So could, could it get to the point where we see them more, you know, visually for the general public? They get to be so ubiquitous? We predicted that they would advance slowly over, over the centuries, but it's, it's a pretty slow increase uh, in activity. So it's going to take probably another generation before they can be seen. In fact, they have been seen over southern Colorado. Occasionally, huh. they, do, they do make an advance uh, toward the equator. Hmm. So they say they might move to the lower latitudes, perhaps. That's a prediction, my prediction, yeah. <laughs> sort of, wow. I, I, you know, that would be, I guess that would be sort of bitter and sweet. <laughs> it's nice right. to have them, no. but we, we're having them because of climate change. That's the idea, yeah. We'd like to, see, we'd like to live to see that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what data do you hope to get uh, uh, out of your NASA mission? What, what kinds of things do you, else do you want to know? Well, the, the principal processes that we're interested in studying are small-scale waves. Uh, we call them gravity waves. They're excited by deep convection. They're excited by airflow over mountains. But they have a unique ability to propagate to very high altitudes very quickly, and they communicate energy and momentum upward. And so they're very important in the large-scale circulation of the atmosphere, but they can't deposit the energy or the momentum until they dissipate. And so they have to do that via instabilities and turbulence. And those processes are really poorly understood. Uh, and one of the motivations for understanding them and one of the motivations for the various agencies funding these things is that if we can better understand these processes, we likely will be in a better position to predict weather and climate. So that those would be some of the very significant outputs of this down the road, potentially. Wow. So, so where, where do you go from here? What do you want to, you know, how do you follow up on this? Well, we have a gigantic amount of data. <laughs> we flew seven cameras on the balloon and a LIDAR that was uh, provided by the German Aerospace Center. So we have really exquisite measurements. Uh, we have a suite of seven cameras, uh, four large fields of view and three narrow fields of view that span uh, a region of the sky from about a uh, hundred kilometers across, uh, and the high resolution of the cameras allows us to see scales as small as about 10 or 20 meters. So this is really, I think, a remarkable experiment. Hmm. It's the only place, I believe, on the planet where there's the potential to see that much variability. And the particularly exciting thing about this mission is it lets, it lets us watch the flow of energy from the waves that bring it to those altitudes all the way through the instabilities and to the turbulence, uh, and it highlights the specific processes by which that wow. happens, which we have a difficult time seeing anywhere else. I can't say, sum it up any better than that. David Fritz, Principal Investigator of NASA's PMC Turbo Mission, and Gary Thomas, Co-Investigator of NASA's uh, Aeronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere. Uh, well, thank you both for taking time to be with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's about all the time we have for this week. If you've missed any part of our program and you'd like to hear it again, subscribe to our podcast. B.J. Lederman composed our theme music. And, of course, every day is Science Friday. We're active all week on all kinds of smart players and all our social media. Have a great week.